I'd like to say a special thing, thanks to Dr. John Newton from American Farm Bureau and Miss Christy Boswell from USDA. And they will be our panelists today. I know both of you are extremely busy, so thank both of you for taking time out to talk with us today. <clears throat> John and Christy, we certainly wish that we could be together in person today, but like most businesses and organizations across the nation, uh, we had to make significant adjustments, adjustment to the coronavirus. One of the more notable changes, of course, is that we have moved away from more traditional in-person meetings and have adopted webinars in a way of reaching folks and getting our information out to our farmers. This is our only second digging in webinar, so we apologize in advance if we have any uh, technical difficulties that might occur. And before we get started, I will cover a few housekeeping items for those that are watching today. The webinar is being recorded. We understand that there is a possibility of outside media being on the call today. With that being said, this is a private meeting and the information shared today is not intended for public reporting. At this time on the call, everyone should be muted to cut down on the background noise. We will have a question and answer segment at the end of our program and there are two ways that you can submit a question at any time you can type your question in the question box in your control panel and we will collect these and address them at the end of our presentation presentation during, during the question and answer part of our program or you can click the button at the bottom of the page to raise your hand and we will recognize you at the end of the program. John and Christy, so that you know, we invited over 20 Georgia Farm Bureau Commodity Advisory Committees to join us on the call today. And that group consists of approximately 200 farmers from throughout the state. These members are some of the best and most respected producers of their respective commodities. And they are geographically located throughout the state. We've also invited other Farm Bureau members from across the state, along with several leaders of various state commodity groups and agricultural associations. And as I stated earlier, we do have some from other states that have joined us today. Now, for those of you who may have joined us a little later, uh, we are honored to have with us today, Dr. John Newton from American Farm Bureau and Christy Boswell, from USDA. They both serve our industry in Washington, D.C., but they do it in a different ways. And we are very excited to have them with us today. Christy will be our first speaker. Uh, Christy works on USDA Secretary Purdue's team in Washington, D.C. as a senior advisor. Before joining USDA, Christy worked on labor issues at American Farm Bureau, which makes part of her family. She is part of our family still. Even though, Christy, you're with USDA, uh, she has uh, recently spent some time serving on President Trump's team at the White House, where she played an integral role in some of the H-2A reform proposal published last year by the U.S. Department of Labor, among other things. And I will say at this time, Christy has actually helped several growers in Georgia to secure some H-2A workers that was much needed. So thank you for that, Christy. We certainly appreciate that. Christy grew up on a farm in southeastern Nebraska and began her career in agriculture as the Ag Youth Coordinator at the Nebraska Department of Agriculture. She is also a licensed attorney. Now, Christy, if I left anything out, please let us know. And please give us some good news about the USDA's new CFAP program. So Christy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, President Long. Uh, and it's always good to be back with Farm Bureau and really appreciate the opportunity to 
to talk to you about the uh, second round of the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Uh, and uh, as, as President Long mentioned, uh, I'm a senior advisor with the Secretary. I handle uh, labor immigration issues, all of the uh, domestic farm program um, and programs, and also trade um, as a liaison between those mission areas, FPAC and TIFA mission areas uh, for the Secretary's office. Uh, so um, I know there's time for some Q&A, and so I'm really open to any of those questions or, or others I can try to bird dog for you within the department. But no, today's focus is really on CFAP2. And, and I also have with me Brad Carmen, um, who is logged in as well for any hard hitting technical questions. He has been uh, leading the team uh, in FSA uh, here um, in, in implementing some of the more fine tuned regulations and, and technical um, items. And so I wanted to make sure that he was there as well to make sure that we had to answer any specific technical questions that you may have. Uh, that you haven't been able to, to get answered from your county office or state office. So uh, as you're all aware, September 17th, the president made the announcement of an additional $14 billion uh, for COVID response for farmers. This is on the heels of $16 billion that was released in April in the original coronavirus food assistance program uh, in CFAP 1. Uh, we uh, were appropriated $9.5 billion from Congress in the CARES Act. Uh, recognizing that was not near enough for the, the need on the ground. Uh, we also immediately pulled six and a half billion from the CCC uh, to total that 16 billion in trying to provide as quick response as we could to the crisis that was going out on the ground. Uh, in that CARES Act, Congress also replenished $14 billion into the CCC that um, that we did not receive actually until July. And so uh, in the, again, the vein of getting out resources quickly, um, we, we anticipated at the, at the beginning that there would be two rounds. I think another benefit of this is uh, we were able to look at CFAP, uh, hear feedback from stakeholders, uh, and be able to make some tweaks and adjustments that hopefully um, have been well received in the second round uh, of, um, of CFAP. Uh, the program provides financial assistance, uh, direct payments that uh, will help producers absorb marketing costs and increase inventory costs as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, see, the biggest distinctions that you will see um, in CFAP2 is that there's three different structures of, of different uh, payment calculations. The first relate to sales commodities. Uh, this is very similar to what you saw in CFAP1 uh, for um, Oh, I'm sorry, sales commodities um, is actually unique um, for CFAP2, learning from CFAP1. Um, and this is really for uh, a lot of specialty crops and aquaculture, uh, nursery would be included in that as well. Also, we were able to add tobacco in uh, from stakeholder feedback. And this approach is, is really as simple as we could make it, um, where producers are uh, paid on their 2019 uh, sales and there's a graduated payment um, cycle there um, for the amount of sales uh, based off of different percentages uh, that's laid out in the rule. Uh, the second category is what is similar to CFAP1 and this is the price trigger commodities uh, where there's a 5% price decline between January and July. Uh, these commodities have payment rates associated with that. This really is uh, for your row crops, livestock, and dairy. And then the third uh, payment calculation category are flat rate row crops. Uh, these are where uh, we either didn't have enough data to uh, calculate a 5% price decline um, or they did, not, they did not trigger the 5% price decline. Uh, there are payments at $15 an acre for those producers um, for eligible 2020 acres. So really robust uh, and try to um, identify different payment calculations that helped fit the individual sectors, recognizing a program this wide and this broad. Uh, there's just so many unique circumstances uh, that we needed to be able to, to have a not one size fits all type of approach. So uh, that hopefully will, will alleviate some of the concerns and issues we had in, in CFAP 1. Uh, also, it allowed us to um, add additional commodities. So uh, the CFAP2 program includes hemp, tobacco, ELS, cotton, um, broilers from non-contract poultry growers, 
shell and dried eggs, turkeys, bison, all classes of wheat and, and many more. So it is a very robust program. Uh, and again, uh, the goal there was to, to try to address the broad COVID-19 and additional inventory and marketing costs associated with that. Uh, there is a, a, a payment limitation, just as there was in CFAP 1, but it is, um, it is separate for CFAP 2, as it is a two, a two uh, separate programs, CFAP and CFAP 2. Um, and there are special payment limitations for corporations, limited liability companies, uh, and also a change from CFAP to CFAP 2 is the inclusion of trusts and estates. Uh, we heard a lot from dairy producers that uh, had those type of, of organizational structures. So we tried to accommodate that as well. Signups have already begun. Uh, so hopefully you've um, contacted your local FSA office. I know, um, and, and Brad may know off the top of his head, uh, we already have quite a, quite a few applications in and, and money going out the door. Um, but the signups began September 21st and they will go through December 11th. Uh, so I uh, really encourage you to contact your local farm service agency. There's also an 800 number that you can start out as well if you're a new customer to USDA and, and trying to answer some of the preliminary questions, getting your paperwork together. Uh, and also check out farmers.gov slash CFAP. There is a lot of information there, frequently asked questions. There's also a dashboard or soon will be on CFAP2 if it's not already live um, of uh, application status, money going out the door and different commodity breakdowns. So we wanna be as open and transparent in this process as possible. Uh, and farmers.gov is a great resource to try to answer your questions. And as always, we want to um, provide the best customer service. So between the 800 number and your local FSA office or, or here at headquarters, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, back to you, President Long, and um, be available for questions afterwards. Okay, thank you, Christy, <clears throat> for those comments. Uh, certainly appreciate what you've done through the years with American Farm Bureau, uh, working at the White House and now with USDA. So thank you very much. <clears throat> and we will take questions at, at the end in a few minutes. Next, we have uh, Dr. John Newton, who is the Chief Economist at American Farm Bureau. And like Christy, he's a good friend of Georgia agriculture. He has a PhD in agricultural economics from Ohio, Ohio State University and began his career on Capitol Hill as a research fellow for the Senate Agricultural Committee. John also spent 10 years as an economist for USDA and served as chief economist for the National Milk Producers Federation before joining American Farm Bureau. We're certainly fortunate to have him in our Farm Bureau family. Uh, John, we certainly appreciate you joining us today on this webinar. Thank you, as, as I serve on the AFBF board, it's always very interesting to have John and come to come and give a presentation at our board meeting, uh, because as you'll see in just a minute, he's a, he's a very sharp individual. So John, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I think they just sent me a text message uh, to see if they could share my screen. Uh, at this point, I don't think I have uh, screen sharing uh, abilities, but if, I, if, if, it, if it is provided to me, uh, you know, Trip, Trip told me to make a beautiful presentation for you. So I spent uh, all weekend uh, making charts for you, uh, President Long. So, uh, so well, Trip- you know Trip will set you up, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll let, let me delay just a little bit and just a uh, big shout out to, to Christy and all the folks at USDA. Uh, you know, I, I sent a question in, uh, Mitt Walker from Alabama, who's, who's TRIP's equivalent uh, there on the National Affairs Coordinator, sent me a, a question. I emailed Jamie Clover Adams, and, and Jamie Clover Adams, instead of answering the question, uh, got us on a conference call with uh, Associate Administrator and Administrator there at FSA to answer all of our questions on CFAT2. Uh, we had some producers call. Uh, some of our tobacco producers in Virginia and our, our uh, horticultural producers in California uh, on some issues with respect to uh, they were under contract to grow for a particular supplier. We raised that question and USDA sent out a clarifying memo uh, within a matter of days. So they've been very, very timely, very, very responsive 
uh, to all the needs of all of our members uh, across the country. And um, I, I don't think I'll have, um, I don't think we'll be able to do slides, but I'll just kind of walk through some of the details uh, of this, this second round, this next CFAP program uh, that was rolled out uh, just, just a few weeks ago. Uh, USDA's cost benefit analysis uh, shows um, the expected outlays, as Christy mentioned, uh, we're at $14 billion in expected outlays for CFAP2. Uh, corn producers are expected to receive about $3.5 billion uh, in CFAP2 payments. The payments are made uh, for your traditional grain producers. They're made based on uh, your 2020 weighted average APH yield uh, multiplied by your acreage. Uh, so that gets you a, a payment rate and a per acre payment. Uh, peanuts there in Georgia are going to be a flat flat rate crop, so they're going to be eligible for a $15 per acre payment. Uh, but corn's expected to be the largest uh, recipient of CFAP2 funds at $3.5 billion. Uh, beef cattle in total are expected to receive about $2.8 billion. Uh, dairy producers are expected to receive uh, close to $2 billion, and that's on top of uh, 1.7 billion, that 1.8 billion actually that they received under CFAP1. Uh, I think beef cattle would receive close to 4 billion under CFAP1. Uh, hogs and pigs are expected to get uh, 1.7 billion. Soybeans 1.4 billion. Wheat 725 million. Cotton 310 million. Uh, eggs, uh, several variety of eggs are eligible. Expected to get 333 million. Broilers are now eligible for independent producers. Uh, that's, uh, they're expected to receive a, a dollar per head payment based on 2019 uh, production, 75% uh, of that, and broilers are expected to receive uh, $280 million. So uh, again, USDA is expecting, uh, based on their cost benefit analysis, to distribute uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $14 billion under CFAP2. Uh, the sign up is open through uh, December 11th, I believe. Uh, on the, the effective payment rates for crops. So USDA announced a, a per unit payment rate and then they announced uh, a crop marketing percentage. So uh, what that means is the percentage of the crop that they expect to be marketed uh, during 2020. So these are losses that uh, COVID-19 related losses that are uh, experienced during this year. Uh, and so if you multiply the percentage that they anticipate being marketed uh, by the payment rate that they announced, uh, cotton payment rates around four cents per pound. Uh, and again, that's then multiplied by uh, your farm's weighted 2020 APH yield uh, or 85% uh, of the Art County yield. I, I believe that Brad Carmen can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure what the conversion is for uh, seed cotton to cotton. Uh, sunflowers at, at one cent per pound. Corn is 23 cent per bushel. Grain sorghum is 31 cents uh, per bushel. Soybeans, 31 cents per bushel. Barley, 34 cents per bushel. And wheat uh, at, at uh, nearly 40 cents per bushel. Uh, and, and I'll get all these charts to trip so that folks on the phone can, can review these uh, at a later date. Uh, the payment per acre, if you were to assume the, the USDA's most recent yield projections applied, uh, we're looking at around $40 an acre for corn, uh, $33 an acre for cotton. Uh, obviously, that's going to be higher if you've got irrigated ground. Uh, grain sorghum, uh, $23 an acre. Soybeans, around $16 an acre. Barley at $27 an acre. Uh, and wheat are at $19.75 per acre. Uh, these are, again, based on national average yields. So if you have higher APH yields on your operation or you're irrigated, uh, you're, you, may, you may expect to receive a higher uh, per acre payment uh, under CFAP2. For our livestock producers, uh, cattle receives $55 uh, per head, uh, and that's based on the maximum inventory uh, on the farm uh, from April 16th through August 31st. Uh, your max head, it's around 4,400 head, I think, is the number that gets you to a payment limit of 250. Uh, and then you multiply that by the number of payment limits that, that your farm uh, has. Uh, so uh, again, $55 per head on cattle, $23 per head on hogs, and $27 uh, per head on lamb and sheep. Uh, dairy producers are also eligible. 
Uh, USDA announced a dollar twenty per hundred weight payment uh, for milk production through uh, April through August. Then they also announced a dollar twenty payment on the expected production for September through December. Uh, complicated formula on the dairy side, uh, but once you simplify it, it's effectively two dollars and sixteen cents per hundred weight for milk production from April through August is what the dairyman. Uh, or dairy farmer will receive uh, based on milk production April through August. And that's, that too is subject to a $250,000 payment limitation. On the uh, broiler side uh, for eggs, uh, shell eggs receive a uh, five cents per dozen. Liquid eggs is uh, four cents a pound. Dried eggs, 14 cents a pound. And frozen eggs, five cents a pound. And then on broilers for independent producers, it's a dollar and one cent per head, and that's based on 75% of 2019 production. And, and I will get these charts to you uh, immediately because it's, I know it can be difficult to follow all the numbers uh, with, without a visual. Uh, on a variety of other crops, uh, for, such as tobacco, aquaculture, floriculture, nursery, specialty livestock, and specialty crops, uh, I think USDA significantly improved the mechanism to deliver uh, relief to these farmers impacted by COVID-19. Uh, what it, it's based on uh, the producer's 2019 sales of the eligible commodities. So if you had uh, $49,000 in tobacco sales in 2019, you would be eligible for a payment around $4,000 for your operation. So it's a tiered payment structure uh, based on your sales volume from 2019 uh, and each sales range. So if you had sales of specialty livestock that were eligible and your sales totaled uh, $99,999 in 2019, uh, you'd get a 10.6% payment based on the first $49,999 and a 9.9% .9 payment on the remainder. <coughs> so uh, it, it does simplify significantly uh, the CFAP uh, payment for specialty crops and specialty livestock. Uh, I think that'll, that'll help deliver more resources to those producers. So uh, I think USDA has indicated that they'll start delivering payment information uh, within the next two weeks. So we'll be able to monitor and share that information uh, with all the states in terms of how much money's gone to Georgia and, and what crops have been paid. And, and uh, so we'll be able to provide that information to you again uh, in a few weeks once that uh, data does uh, become available. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll uh, be happy to entertain any questions that folks may have. And I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you all today. Okay, John, <clears throat> thank you very much. And I was going to ask you uh, uh, about specifically about Georgia and the crops that we grow down here, but I think you covered about everything that could be covered with some numbers. So, so thank you for all that information. <clears throat> but my dude, boss now happens to be from from Georgia, so if I don't I, cover the Georgia crops, I'm, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> we understand too. Okay, <laughs> we certainly do, but. Uh, we are looking forward to get all of those charts from you so we can share them with our, with our members and our producers. So uh, thank, thank you for that, John. Uh, we know that y'all have been very, very busy putting all of this together. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll take some questions. Uh, so if you got some questions, you can un unmute your mic. And for those of you that's joining us by phone, you can hit star nine and we will recognize you for your question. But then you will need to unmute, unmute your phone by using star six. So do have it. I got a couple of questions, but I'll, uh, I'll open it up first and see if anyone has any specific question for John or for Christy. Have any questions? Y'all must have done a pretty good job of explaining things. <clears throat> if you think of something, y'all please let us know. 
Christy, in the meantime, uh, you mentioned that the majority of the funding for this program comes from the CCC. Uh, we know that the CC fund support a number of programs, including our ARC and our PLC, marketing assistant programs, and, and more. Is it possible that the use of these existing USDA funds could lead to a shortfall in other programs? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we, um, you know, President Long, you're correct. Um, you know, we utilize the CCC funds um, for this. Um, and just for kind of everyone who doesn't live in, in this bubble, um, the Credit Corporation, um, the Credit Commodity, Commodity Credit Corporation Act um, created this fund uh, that we utilize to, um, you know, for the Part of the charter um, that supports most farm bill programs. ARC PLC, as the president mentioned, uh, included in that. Uh, and so each year uh, that is replenished um, generally. And uh, we have had to ask in the past for an, an early replenishment to make sure that we can, can get all those statutory required payments out. Um, specifically that occurred last year uh, with the market facilitation program and this year um, with the direction from Congress to spend the 14 billion dollars on COVID response uh, we were in and, and still remain to be in that same situation uh, when we were working through um, the need for more COVID response and the intent of Congress based off of the uh, 14 billion dollars being included in this in the CARES Act along with many public statements, many letters from members of Congress. Uh, the Secretary spoke to leadership uh, in the Senate and, and made sure that they all understood that utilizing this funding, which is needed and was needed, uh, would require um, a, a replenishment in an um, earlier fashion than traditionally of the CCC to maintain our, our, our um, prioritization of the other statutory required payments. And so, um, you know, late last week or, or the week before, there was a lot of negotiations going on in the House. Um, and um, fortunately, in the House bill, there was included uh, a replenishment. Uh, we expect that to be tracked through the Senate this week. Uh, but, uh, you know, that is in incredibly critical and appreciate the work of American Farm Bureau and, and Georgia Farm Bureau in those efforts and communicating the need for um, an anomaly replenishment of the CCC to make sure that we can continue our obligations, as you all as you all know, many of which go out in the first quarter of the fiscal year. And so um, we are not completely in the clear yet, although um, the House was certainly the hurdle. So um, we um, are, are grateful for a lot of the work um, I know of the, of the stakeholder community and, and communicating that. And we certainly did a lot of technical expertise and, and reach outs as well to make sure that we could meet those obligations. So um, nothing is final until the continuing resolution is completely final. Um, so continue to um, you know we, we continue to provide question, answers to questions if they exist. But um, uh, that is uh, it was a, a little bit of a um, you know rigmarole of for the last few weeks and making sure that um, that need was understood and we're still communicating the true function of the CCC and how some of the inside baseball plays there as far as treasury and appropriations and, and some of the, the paperwork that is that is used back and forth. But um, we um, you know, are continuing to monitor that very closely. Okay, thank you, Christy. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Lucy Ray. Miss Ray, you have a question? Yes, sir, President Long. Um, I work in extension for a day job, and I know we've had several beef cattle producers contact our office asking exactly what counted as breeding stock. Um, seed stock producers that um, perhaps were not able to have a bull sale or sell, um, you know, virgin bulls, yearling bulls this year, um, heifers that um, have not calved, are they technically breeding stock or are they eligible under this program? Um, I just wondered if you could give a little more direction on that. Thanks for the question, Lucy. Brad, I think this might be a great one for, for you to jump in. Um, Lucy is referencing a change that was actually made in, in CFAP, between CFAP 1 and CFAP 2. CFAP 1 um, included marketing and breeding stock. CFAP 2 uh, only uh, covers marketing stock. But as Lucy mentions, there are a lot of intricacies to that. So um, 
Um, if you could, Brad, address that question. So first, can people see me and hear me and or hear me? Yes? Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, so as you know, breeding stock are in ineligible for CFAP2. It basically includes cows and bulls. And then there are some gray areas that I think you're addressing. Uh, we don't have all the answers on that yet. We're huddling in Washington. I expect to have that out in the next day or two. So I'm sorry I can't answer your question specifically because there are some nuances that we have to get into the details with. And we'll do that. I expect to release some more information tomorrow. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Ms. Ray, for that question. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> We've heard a few definitions of what a producer's weighted APH is. Uh, can one of you provide, provide any guidance on this? Christy, you want me to take that again? Please. <laughs> so if a, so APH, as you all know, crop in, it's a yield from crop insurance. So we're working with our sister agency, RMA, to get the APH. FSA is not computing it. RMA will be computing it for us. And if a producer has one unit, let's say corn, and his APH is 150 bushels, naturally the weighted average of if only one unit is 150 bushels. If he has several units, you know, one yield is 150, another is 100, another one is 125 bushel yield, then we weight it by acres. So we're taking a producer's APH for each of his units and weighing it by the acres on each unit to get a weighted average APH. And if producers has multiple units, multiple counties, multiple states, we have one APH per crop for that producer nationwide. Okay. Thank you, Brad, on that. <clears throat> As you probably know, in Georgia, uh, I won't say 100%, but a large percent of our uh, poultry growers are contract growers. Uh, is there a chance that we could uh, tweak the program uh, in, the, in the coming weeks to include them? You, you see any chance of that happening? Uh, thanks for the question, and, and we definitely recognize that this is a challenge that we have had uh, with the poultry industry um, and, and the requirements of USDA programs. Um, CFAP2, as, um, as, is, as um, out there as a final rule, um, there won't be changes to that um, outside of any technical corrections that need to be had. Um, but I, I want to emphasize that the secretary acknowledges that unique nature of the poultry and pork uh, industry to a certain degree and are trying to evaluate what other um, authorities we would have uh, and also have provided technical assistance to Congress as different drafts have come through of a phase four of COVID response um, to try to um, you know, address those uh, producers that maybe had missed cycles because of COVID, uh, but don't necessarily have ownership in the birds. And so uh, nothing, um, unfortunately, that we can do in CFAP2, but it is on our radar and we are trying to, to think creatively about what authorities we have and funding sources we have to maybe help address some of those, uh, those needs. Okay, thank you, Christy. <clears throat> uh, could the uh, CFAP 2.0 payments affect my payments or payment limitations for other USDA programs like the ARC or PLC. You know, for an example, as we grow corn, cotton, and peanuts, uh, and pecans on the farm, obviously I have several different payment formulas in that scenario. Uh, what about the payment limits, and will I have payment limit for each commodity or one program level payment limit? So the payment limit for CFAP2 is separate and distinct from the payment limit in CFAP1 and, uh, and other um, you know, payment limits that may apply. Um, and so um, it won't directly affect uh, your, your ARC PLC payment limit um, or frankly, um, if, if there are still applications uh, pending for CFAP um, that haven't been processed yet, that, that sign up date has ended September 11th. But, um, 
it would be separate from those those other programs. Um, you did mention uh, by commodity. I do want to clarify on CFAP two. It is one um, payment limit uh, with um, up to one fifty thousand, unless you have those special circumstances based off of um, the the legal entity. So I, it is not based on commodity per commodity. So you wouldn't get two hundred fifty thousand dollars for corn, two hundred fifty thousand dollars per um, for soybeans, for example. It would be based off of the program, um, but um, it would be and is separate and distinct from uh, CFAP one or other USDA Farm Bill programs. Okay, thank you, Christy. <clears throat> now next, I'd like to recognize Samantha McLeod. Miss McLeod, you have a question. Yes, thank you, President uh, President Long. Um, uh, good morning, and thank you for hosting this for us. Um, my question specifically relates to um, your weighted APH for uh, crops nationwide. Um, I was curious if that does apply also to specialty crops, and in specifically if that does apply to pecan production. Okay, which one of y'all want to take that question? Brad, go for it. Yeah. Um, so it depends what bucket the specialty crops are in. If you know, specialty crops are basically in, you, you look at sales, so you don't need to look at a producer's APH then. We're looking at 2019 sales to determine uh, payments for specialty crops. So APH does not enter into the picture for those. It's basically just your row crops where we're using APHs. And clarify, Brad, I believe this is right, that pecans are included in that sales approach. That's correct, yes. Great, thank you so much. And it's just 2019 sales, correct? Right, for... Yes. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLeod. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Miss um, Ray, uh, you got another question? Sorry, y'all. I'm asking all kind of questions today. I agree. That's what we're here for. <laughs> um, I serve on the Equine Commodity um, Advisory Committee for Georgia, and I was just wondering if y'all could share a little bit of the thought process behind equine, um, which I believe is is still classified as livestock in the 2016 Farm Bill, um, why it was not included um, in this in this program. Yeah, I think Brad and I can probably jointly uh, address this. Um, so the, the secretary's focus was on unmarketable um, and, and marketing livestock. Um, I know the FSA team kind of looked into to kind of the reach of, of that and, and the um, species that were included in that. Brad, I don't know if there was other discussion that the undersecretary were, uh, was involved in as well. Yeah, most of the livestock that we deal with in FSA is related to food production or some product from the animal equine really does not fit into that uh, niche. That's why it was excluded. That's it. I just know that the um, breeding operations had been kind of hard hit um, through through all of this, this spring specifically. Um, thank y'all all for your time. I really appreciate y'all being available to questions. This has been great. Thank you. Okay. I want to say thanks to everyone that joined us today. I hope this was very informative. Uh, Christy, as always, good to see you. I'd rather see you in person, but uh, glad, to, glad to see your face anyhow. Thank you for everything that you do uh, for agriculture. And John, as always, thank you for what you do at AFBF, the reports that you give, uh, and, the, and your willingness to respond to whether, whatever state it is when they have questions. So thank you for what you do. Again, thank each one of y'all for joining. Uh, we will be having some more, some more webinars in the near future, so be on the lookout for those. Again, 
Christian John, thank y'all for joining us. Uh, everyone have a good day.